Can you hear it? The pulse of our region. It's starting to sound like progress. It's happening here, and here, and there, all around us. We're gaining momentum and catalyzing change. But it doesn't happen on its own. We need each other. Every person, every business, every organization, we all play a role. We're leading. We're collaborating. We're growing. Yeah, we've had some wins. But we still have work to do. We're leveraging our assets. Investing in innovation. And creating opportunities for everyone here to share in this momentum. The pulse of our region is strong. It's steady. It's rhythmic. Can you hear it? Can you see it? Are you a part of it? Every beat represents the commitment, the drive, the determination that is uniquely Akron. Our progress is palpable, but we've only just begun. We're gaining traction and building something powerful, something together, something greater. Welcome to the 2021 Women of Achievement Awards Program, brought to you by the Women's Network Leadership Institute and the Greater Akron Chamber. My name is Jan Conrad, Executive Director of the WNLI, whose mission is to connect, inspire, and empower women through thought leadership, research, and best-in-class training to expand diversity of leadership and drive economic parity in our community. Thank you for joining us to honor Greater Akron's extraordinary female leaders. As you will soon hear, these women are trailblazers and change agents. I can't wait for you to meet these incredible females. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors who support the mission and the work of WNLI. This morning's presenting sponsors are Akron Children's Hospital, Browse McDowell, Huntington Bank, Key Bank, Rutzel, and State and Federal Communications. And premier sponsors include Sickich and the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Thank you again for your generous support of our efforts. I also want to thank all who submitted nominations. The task of choosing one winner in each category was daunting. We hope that you all apply again next year. As one judge commented, I'm blown away by all of these women making significant contributions in Greater Akron, including many names I do not know. That speaks to the powerful female talent in our community. And to this year's judges, thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration of each submission. And now it's my privilege to introduce to you the 2021 Laura Alio Emerging Leader Award winner. This award is named in memory of Laura Alio, who was honored as an emerging leader in 2016 to note the accomplishments and potential of this budding female leader. To know Laura is to love Laura for her courage, compassion, and her love of her Akron community. Laura loved life and lived with an authenticity that was captivating. She mirrored that authenticity in her journey with breast cancer as she encouraged women around the world to fight valiantly and to always believe in miracles. She received her angel wings in January of 2019. Today's winner, like Laura, has been an active trendsetter and encourages success among women. She is active in serving her community through the Board of Directors for Victims Assistance Program and is co-chair of the annual Mardi Gras Gala. She's on the Board of Directors for the Conference of Court, 
public information officers, and she sits on the committee for Ellen's Effort, a melanoma awareness nonprofit. She's also active as a YPN at the Greater Akron Chamber and a 2019 30 for the Future awardee. Congratulations to the 2021 Laura Alio Emerging Leader, Nicole Hagee, Community Outreach and Grants Coordinator at Akron Municipal Court. Thank you so much for this incredible honor. I cannot tell you how much the Laura Alio Emerging Leader Award means to me. Although I did not know Laura, I have been able to meet individuals she impacted. Her beautiful legacy lives on through her family and all who knew her. I have been told that Laura and I share a passion for literacy. I was lucky to have books of my own as a child. My mom took me to the library regularly. Recently, I led a project to install a little free library outside our courthouse in downtown Akron. I know not everyone is as lucky as I was, and it warms my heart when I see families visiting our little free library. When I graduated from Walsh University in 2007 with a BA in marketing, it was a tough time to be looking for work. Opportunities in the marketing field were few and far between. That experience of exploring every option, no matter if it did or didn't align with my career plan, taught me so much. It was a tough point in my life, so I volunteered as much as I could. It filled my soul and built my network. Ultimately, I landed a position with the Stark County District Library in their public information department. That was my first career step, and it opened my eyes to so much. My coworkers became my friends, and serving the public gave me a greater desire to instill a love for reading into the lives of others. In 2013, I earned my master's degree in integrated marketing communications from West Virginia University in tandem with pursuing the next chapter of my life. Reaching that goal had a positive impact on my career. For the past four years, I have had the honor and privilege of representing the Akron Municipal Court as the Community Outreach and Grants Coordinator. In that role, I was introduced to the Victim Assistance Program and all they do for victims of crime in Summit County. I now serve Victim Assistance as a board member and as the co-chair for their annual Mardi Gras Gala. I've met inspirational men and women who've overcome incredible obstacles, something that will never get old. In my 36 years, I have met countless inspiring women but today I would like to thank one in particular. My high school tennis coach, Leslie Smith, made a huge impact on my life. She encouraged me to pursue tennis in college and increased my self-esteem through praise and kind words. She was the first person in my life to call me a leader and she often reminded me of my innate traits that aligned well with positive leadership. Like my former coach, I want to pay it forward. Mentorship had an impact on my life and was instrumental throughout my journey. Like all of us, I've had plans go awry and things not turned out as I had hoped. But without those detours, I might not be here today. I've learned to embrace change. It took a while, but I'm just so grateful I did it. So find your tribe and don't let anyone steal your joy. Akron is home to fantastic people and fantastic initiatives. I'm proud to be a part of this community and I vow to live life like Laura. Thank you. Congratulations, Nicole, and thank you for sharing those words with us. Dorothy O. Jackson, for whom our next award is named, was Akron's Goodwill Ambassador. In 1984, she was appointed Deputy Mayor by Mayor Tom Sawyer and served in that role for 20 years. She was the first African-American woman to serve in that capacity. She garnered that position because of her leadership at Goodwill and as the Human Services Administrator for 20,000 AMHA residents, where she directed award-winning service programs. This award, named in her honor, recognizes a business or organization that has demonstrated excellence and leadership in their commitment to the empowerment of women and promotion of diversity in the workplace. This year's winner is Crum and Forster Pet Insurance Group, whose mantra is, at CNF Pet, you will belong. It is lived out through the entire organization where there is perfect parity in senior leadership. Their Women Amplifying Value and Equity ERG hosts regular workshops covering topics such as career development and balancing one's personal and professional life. At CNF Pet, the pathway to leadership opportunities is accessible to all. 
Congratulations to Crum and Forrester Pet Insurance Group. Here to accept the award on their behalf is Vice President Liz Watson. I am so honored to accept this year's Dorothy O. Jackson Award on behalf of our team here at Crum and Forster Pet Insurance Group. At CNF Pet, we highly value inclusivity and diversity. When we say, at CNF Pet you belong, we mean it. One of the top bits of feedback we receive from job candidates and other client visitors to our office is how welcoming and friendly our team is. And I don't just mean the wagging tails of our office dogs. We work hard to ensure CNF Pet is an enjoyable and enriching work environment for every team member, and I think it shows. From your first interview to your many career milestones, we seek to provide all employees with the skills, mentorship, and training they need to succeed at our organization. One of my favorite quick facts is that nearly three quarters of our employees are female. That's just over 63% in the management team. And we boast perfect parity in the senior leadership team, of which I'm proud to be a part. We have a strong focus on equal pay for equal work. And in our last big round of promotions, 15 out of 17 of the advancements were made by women. And all our employees have access to career pathing tools, educational assistance, work from home options, and paid parental leave. We pride ourselves on our open and honest communication, which is why every employee has a direct line to leadership, should they like to provide feedback. It helps us foster a better environment of understanding, appreciation, and innovation. Additionally, our internal belonging at CNF program and the numerous employee resource groups serve to highlight and celebrate the many diverse experiences, identities, and opinions present at our company. As an organization, we also value community involvement. In addition to company-sponsored volunteer events, we donate our time to organizations nominated and chosen by our employees. We're proud to sponsor community events like the Akron Pride Festival. Plus, our CNF care programs enables every employee to further support their community by giving an annual donation or volunteer time match per employee up to $10,000 for organizations that mean the most to them. As an Akron native myself, I recall Ms. Jackson to be a force of nature, a strong and lasting presence in our community. She dedicated her career to affecting positive change in the city of Akron, a goal Crum and Forster Pet Insurance Group strives for as well. Thank you to the Selection Committee, the Greater Akron Chamber, and the Women's Network Leadership Institute for this award. And thank you too to our team members who help us make every day an empowering and enriching experience for all. Congratulations, Crum and Forrester, and thank you, Liz, for those comments. And now I'd like to introduce you to today's amazing panelists. These women are leading us into a new frontier in Greater Akron. As the only in many situations, they will offer insight into their encounters with unexpected challenges, pivots, lessons learned, and how those experiences became their defining moments. Ms. Ramona Hood, President and CEO of FedEx Custom Critical, is the first African American to head a FedEx subsidiary in the company's 47-year history. The story of her success began when in 1991, as a young mother and college student, she was hired as an administrative assistant. Her career blossomed over various roles in operations, safety, sourcing, and sales and marketing. In those positions, Ms. Hood began offering innovative and strategic ideas that distinguished her from her peers. She not only brought unique approaches to the business, but she did so in a way that brought out the best in others. From humble beginnings, her strong work ethic and strategic mindset were key to her opportunities for advancement in leadership. In January of 2020, she was named President and CEO of FedEx Custom Critical. Ramona holds a BA in Business Management from Walsh University and an Executive Master of Business from the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western University. 
Our second panelist, Dr. Jennifer Savitsky, has been a member of the medical staff of Cleveland Clinic Akron General since 2001, after graduating from East Tennessee State University Quinlan College of Medicine. She is active in graduate medical education and hospital administration, having previously been the program director for the OB GYN residency and is currently the chair of the department of OBGYN, the first woman to hold either of those positions in the hospital's 100 plus year history. Dr. Savitsky developed Akron General's first forensic medical program called the PATH Center, providing access to healing. The program was initially developed in 2015 as a response to the community's need for forensic medical services related to sexual violence. The PATH Center now serves all patients and caregivers of CCAG who have experienced any aspect of trauma related to victimization. In 2020, the PATH Center cared for over 1,000 patients. Dr. Savitsky is a proud member of the Akron community and is active in issues related to maternal infant health, gender equity, and women in leadership. She serves as a co-chair for the Services Action Team of Akron's full-term First Birthday Collaborative. She is also the president of the Women's Network Leadership Council and on the executive committee of the Greater Akron Chamber. She lives in West Akron with her husband and three daughters. Finally, I am pleased to introduce you to our third panelist and 2021 Woman of Achievement. She joins a long list of distinguished women whose leadership and commitment to the success of other women has been extraordinary. Women who have received this honor have a history of breaking down barriers, mentoring others, and taking risks to support the progress of women. The 2021 Woman of Achievement is Dr. Rachel Yvonne Talton, CEO of the award-winning firm Synergy International Limited Incorporated. Synergy's purpose is to help organizations inspire, connect, and engage with customers to flourish and grow. Dr. Rachel, as she is affectionately called, is also the Chief Transformation Officer, or CTO, of Flourish Leadership LLC and the Flourish Conference for Women in Leadership, which provides high-achieving female executives and entrepreneurs with executive coaching, masterminding cohorts, and the company's signature offering, Transformation Immersion. Transformation Immersion Retreats provide an in-depth analysis and mentoring to help executive women flourish in both their professional careers and personal lives. She is also the author of the book, Flourish, How to Have It All Without Losing Yourself. Dr. Rachel earned her doctorate in management from Case Western Reserve University Weatherhead School of Management, where she also served as an adjunct professor in marketing. She also holds a diversity and inclusion training certificate from Cornell University. Her research is focused on the impact of perceptions of trust, satisfaction, and value on consumer loyalty in dynamic industry environments. She holds an MBA with a concentration in finance from Cleveland State University, as well as a BA in psychology. She serves on the board of directors of the Cuyahoga Community College Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, as well as Jumpstart, Inc. She also served on the board of directors and executive committee of Destination Cleveland, where she chaired the marketing committee for six years. Dr. Rachel has a remarkable story. It is one of triumph and tragedy, resilience and faith, and embracing risk through her venture into business. There is so much more that could be said about this amazing female leader who has been a pillar of leadership in Northeast Ohio. Congratulations to the 2021 
Woman of Achievement honoree, Dr. Rachel Yvonne Talton. Good morning, good morning, and thank you so much for joining us to celebrate the power of women. Thank you to the YWCA, to the Greater Akron Chamber, and to the WNLI. I am so honored, humbled, and frankly blessed to receive the Women of Achievement Award. This award exemplifies a leader who advocates for social change in the Akron community. And I'm so proud to do that, but I wouldn't be able to were it not for the examples set by my ancestors, by my grandmother, my great grandmothers, and my beloved mom. My family, friends, mentors, colleagues, all of whom have supported me. And my biggest cheerleader and best friend, my husband, James Talton. That said, I would be remiss if I did not include our team at Synergy as well in these acknowledgements. No one achieves success without the support of a strong team. So thank you, Synergy, for all you do. I wanna share with you a few things that I hope will inspire you on this day. First off, when the pandemic hit, I thought that we were going to lose everything. We've been in business for 20 years and one event can change everything. But like times before, we refused to give in. We leaned on our training, our expertise, and our faith to overcome the challenges of the pandemic. We had started this business, Synergy International Inc., to provide research and insights and leadership development tools to corporations, nonprofit organizations, and government entities. We also did diversity, equity, and inclusion work, but I call that my God job. That was kind of over here, while my real job was research and leadership development. But on May 25th, when George Floyd was killed before all of our eyes, my God job became my day job immediately. Four days later, I registered for Cornell's DEI certification, not that I need any more degrees, <laughs> and was determined to awaken every single day to eradicate racism, misogyny, homophobia, and any other ism that disallows the treatment of human beings with respect and dignity. Since then, our business has tripled, but most importantly, the most important thing is that I still wake up every day committed to the eradication of systemic racism and any other ism that harms our beloved humanity. I hope this inspires you to do a few things. First of all, never give up, ever, never give up. Secondly, create the job that brings you joy and makes the world sing every single day. Third, remember your value. And importantly, remember the purpose, passion and priorities that you have been blessed with and get about the work of making the world a better place every single day. I know that you can do it. May God bless you and keep you. And thank you so very much for this honor. And now I would like to introduce the moderator for today's Defining Moments conversation, Montrella Jackson the amazing CEO and court administrator for the Akron Community, uh, the Akron Municipal Court, a position that she has held since 2012. Good morning, Montrella. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Rachel. And congratulations as this year's recipient of the Women of Achievement Award. Thank you. So a uh, good morning, everyone, and greetings from downtown Akron. Greetings to the panelists. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to moderate today's panel. It is not often we have the opportunity to hear from three panelists who could each easily capture our attention for hours in their own right. We hope that you will find guidance in their words, advice offered today. So without further delay, let's begin. 
The last year has been unprecedented in so many ways. I know you have all been impacted differently. Let us start by acknowledging the changes in the last year and learning more about how it has shifted your work and taught you something new. A question for everyone as we begin, how has the last year impacted you and did you learn anything new about yourself along the way? I'll, I'll go ahead and start. <laughs> um, you know, obviously being in the medical community this last year has impacted us and me significantly. Um, you know, on top of all of the things that were happening um, that Dr. Rachel mentioned around um, social justice and equity and systemic racism, um, dealing with the COVID pandemic um, has just been unbelievable, unbelievable. And I know that everybody feels the same way. I think the thing that really um, made me real, something that uh, I realized about myself during this is um, how adaptable I could be with change. Um, I think, you know, change is one of those things that um, everybody has difficult difficulty with, um, but I really feel so blessed to have been able to um, adapt to that change and really help to lead my teams through that change in a way that helps us keep our eye on the, you know, on our North Star of caring for patients and caring for our community. Um, so I, I feel uh, very grateful to have been able to adapt in that way. You know what, um, thank you, Dr. Jen, for that response. Um, I, I'll go next because I think our our responses are very aligned, obviously not surprisingly. Um, you know, I, I, what I've learned is that you can really create positives out of negatives. No matter what is going on in your life, no matter what challenges you are facing, and we are living through three pandemics right now, healthcare, a racial pandemic, and an economic one. And at the end of the day, regardless of the situation that you're in, you can create a positive out of that. And so I watched the resilience of Americans and people all around the world as we shifted in our work and, and the way that we work and the way that we cared for each other. We couldn't even visit folks in the hospital, right? Um, you know, during a part of this time. But we were able to get around it. We were able to pull together and get around it. So I think that's the biggest lesson um, that I've learned. I've also learned to uh, even to to lean even heavier and more into my faith. I think um, you know I've always been a faithful person, but boy, the past 18, 19 months have taught me to really deepen my faith and um, and depend on it. And finally, I've learned that um, as relationships have evolved um, through these three pandemic pandemics, I think I've learned to be more sensitive to the needs of others, but also more sensitive to my own needs um, and caring for myself in addition to caring for others. What do you think, Ramona? Well, I will, I'll round it up, but before I do that, I do want to just thank the uh, Greater Akron Chamber for the reception last night. It was really great uh, to get the energy to uh, honor uh, great women, uh, and then this morning to, to start with this panel. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, when I reflect on uh, really the last uh, 17, 18 months and, and counting, uh, there's a couple things that come to mind to me. Um, the first is early in March, realizing what was going on with the global pandemic and how it was impacting the U.S. and how in Ohio we were starting to shut down. Uh, it was really around agility, the ability to uh, shift uh, and respond very quickly. Um, and the things that we needed to do as a critical organization and industry uh, to move our team members to working from home. Uh, we didn't do a project charter and a project plan. Uh, we took three business days uh, and we moved all of our team members uh, to working uh, from home. And our, our focus was to uh, test as we went and try to break the infrastructure uh, and then fix it 
uh, if we did that. Um, and we were successful and continued to work uh, from home. So that ability to uh, adopt and shift is, is really important. And uh, I think the whole organization demonstrated that over the last year. Um, the second piece, and it's a little bit more personal for me, I think is after the murder of George Floyd, uh, really leaning into my own authenticity. Um, as, a, as a leader, as a new president and CEO, uh, there were so many emotions that came with what happened um, of uh, being upset, uh, fear, anger, uh, and then hope, um, and being able to truly show up every day uh, and share that with my organization and be focused on a mission of action um, really, to me, uh, allowed me to lean into authenticity uh, and move forward in a way where I, I choose not to be apologetic for it uh, either. Very good. So as we all know, there are certain things about us that make us unique, that differentiate us from others and position us for the kind of growth and success we set our eyes on. But we recognize that there are qualities and characteristics that are critical and distinctive that help us get there. Let's learn a little more about what makes you you. So let's start with Ramona. What qualities that you possess do you believe have been instrumental to your success? I think a couple qualities uh, I think are important and ones that, that I exhibit. Uh, the first is, is what I call intellectual curiosity. Uh, always willing to learn and, and grow. Uh, I've been very intentional with that uh, in my life, uh, open to new skills and new experiences. Um, and that requires uh, me to get comfortable with the uncomfortable, uh, being able to uh, take risk. And I think those are good qualities for uh, a leader and someone who has a, a growth mindset. And can you talk a little bit more, more about uh, how that mindset has prepared you for success and growth? Uh, absolutely. When Jan did our, our bio, she shared uh, a little bit about my story starting in an entry level position. Uh, I was also a, a young mom. Uh, and so for me, um, my career journey was uh, unique from the standpoint of uh, how I navigated through the organization. Uh, I learned uh, skills in our safety department. Uh, I knew I wanted to be in leadership and I knew those opportunities were in the operational area. Um, so I um, chose to seek out those opportunities to gain and learn uh, at the same time to continue my education. Um, and then from uh, operations, I, I moved to our sales department, um, not with the intent of being a salesperson, but I knew being well-rounded would serve me well in the future. Um, and so I did that and then realized that more structured education uh, would also be something uh, that would assist me. And so I chose to go back to school to get my executive uh, MBA. Um, and so I, I've done that and I've chosen to be involved in industry uh, associations serving on, on boards to continue to understand what's going on at a macro and a micro level in, in my industry, uh, as well as serving on local community boards, uh, such as SUMA and Summit Education um, Initiative. Uh, while I give back my time and talent, I'm also continuing to learn and grow. Um, and so I've been very in intentional with that and continue to do so. Amazing. That's awesome, Ramona. I really love um, hearing about how your that intellectual curiosity and then your intentionality around that has really, um, you know, paved your path, and uh, you know, it's really inspiring. Thank yeah. you. I couldn't agree more, and um, just the the honor and privilege to be able to watch you flourish literally uh, before our eyes is just it's just incredible, just incredible. Now, as I mentioned, each of you could easily fill the hours of the day with your amazing things you've accomplished. So um, then Dr. Jen, can you share, you've mentioned about the importance of relationships, trust and mutual respect. Can you talk about why these qualities have been critical to your growth and how you've nurtured those qualities over time? 
Right. You know, um, definitely you can imagine in healthcare, um, you know, being able to have that, those foundational relationships with patients was a part of my training in medical school. And certainly, um, you know, what I've tried to develop over time uh, as I, as I partner with patients in their healthcare, um, as I've moved into the area of um, hospital administration, uh, those relationships are even more important um, with my colleagues and with those other individuals that I work with um, in the hospital. Um, it, it really, what I've tried to do over the course of my career to, to nurture or to foster those skills is um, really understanding or trying to understand where other people are coming from. Um, in medicine, we use a concept called trauma-informed care, which means that individuals um, have a lifetime of experience and they come to us um, in medicine per se with these lifetimes of experiences. And I cannot impress upon my values or my experiences on that individual as I'm trying to um, partner with them in their own healthcare. In reality, we can take that approach with all people, um, you know, in, in, the work, in the work relationships, um, even in personal relationships. You know, people come to each other with these individual lifetime experiences. And we have to respect those experiences and respect those people as, as individuals and not impress upon them our own value system or our own judgments. And so I think really, um, you know, it's, it, it was really learning about trauma-informed care, really learning about how to, um, you know, foster mutual relationships and mutual respect and really developing um, empathy, uh, which is such a huge part of practicing medicine. Um, those are the things that helped me to develop those relational skills um, in my medical practice, uh, but also has significantly impacted my professional um, you know, practice and administration as well. And I, I'm so thankful to be able to develop these relationships with people. And I definitely have seen um, kind of the fruits of my labor in developing those relationships. And I've also observed, you know, when you hear about those doctors who have terrible bedside manner, uh, really it's because of their deficits in relationship skills. Uh, and I think that uh, we, we could all use, um, you know, some development in, in how we develop our relationships and, and how we approach people with that concept of mutual respect. Thank you, Dr. Jen. For the years I've known you, that's the thing that strikes me when we first met was um, just your ability to, your humility and your ability to empathize and share the stories of others. So let's move on to Dr. Rachel. Um, you've spoken before about um, everyone having a superpower and um, something they uniquely do and bring to the table. What are yours? Can you share that with the group today? Sure, um, and, uh, and, and thank you, uh, Ramona and Dr. Jen, with whom we share superpowers. Um, <laughs> again, not surprisingly, um, you know, if I had to name the, the superpowers that God gave me, I would say they're the following three. First is empathy. I mean, I, I, I was just born an empath. So when people feel something, I feel it too. When they're in pain, I'm in pain too. Um, and that's, that has just been the way that I've been um, my whole life. Another is trustworthiness. If I say I'm for you, um, then believe me, <laughs> I have your back forever um, and um, and and that that level of dedication to the point that dr. Jen was making I think builds trust and builds um, uh, you know the, the the perception of dependability competence and benevolence which are the three pillars of, of trustworthiness and then finally strategic thinking um, you know th that combination of being empathetic and being able to look at the big picture of an issue and say, oh, the answer is over here. Being able to pull back the aperture with people and, um, and show them where the solution is or show them where the, op at least the opportunities for solving problems is, um, I think to Ramona's point, breeds the, um, at least the tools the resources for leadership doesn't necessarily create great leaders, right? Because there are, are, are leaders who don't necessarily exercise both their strategic abilities and their empathy 
And for me, both are important to be a transformational leader, right? It is, it's important to be able to um, think strategically, solve problems, to innovate and to create solutions for the world. And I think that as we um, move out of this, these three pandemics or as we uh, change and, and go through the, the, the transformation that we're going through now, transformational leaders are critical so both being able to solve problems, but do so with empathy and with benevolence in your heart for humanity. I think that, I think that both are really um, critical to becoming the kind of leaders that we are going to need moving into uh, the 20, you know, into to 2022. And, you know, listening to, listening to you talk, Rachel, I, I swear to God, this is not like a um, commercial for our mm -hmm. Leading with Strengths curriculum, but, um, Hearing you talk and hearing you talk, Ramona, as well, uh, really reminds me of um, you know as we're as we're working with young leaders or leaders who are young in their leadership journey, um, and and we talk about trying to help them to identify the innate strengths that they have, and how do you leverage those strengths? How do you develop those strengths? And then how do you surround yourself with people who can help um, have complementing strengths? And I love hearing your stories about the strengths that you have and the suit. I love the superpower concept. <laughs> you know, the superpowers that you have, Dr. Rachel, the superpowers that you have, Ramona, um, those are really those strengths. And um, to hear you talk about how you really um, explored those and capitalized on those um, to, to help you to get to where you are is, boy, it's really a great demonstration of how important it is that we, we we tap into those strengths that we have that really make up who we are as a person. You know, thank you, Dr. Jen. And, and one thing that I would add is um, the power of networks, the power of yeah. each other, right? Yeah. Um, so nobody gets here alone. And so as I think about my superpower or we think about Marvel comics, right? right. It, it's like <laughs> yeah. you have the Hulk, but then you have, right? right? And then you have yeah. Captain America and then yeah. you have Iron Man, all of whom have very different superpowers, but they're so much better together. And what I love about that concept is that we, we understand that we have these strengths, these superpowers, these blessings, but we also understand that we have weaknesses. I am, you know, I'm not a detail-oriented, Ramona knows this well, I am not a detail-oriented person. I'm a big picture thinker. Um, and so it's important for me to have people who can focus on the details around me. It's important for me not to, to over lean on my quote unquote superpowers and not understand what my weaknesses are, which brings me back to the power of community, um, the power of networks, the power of friendships, the power of trust um, and, and, and being a trustworthy partner with your, with your friends and your clients uh, as well. Your friends, your team and your clients. As I hear both of you talk, there's uh, two things that come to my mind as well. I think it's important as a leader uh, that you have diversity in, in your team. And part of that is uh, having different thoughts, being able to have complementary skills. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, everyone has to have a certain level of self-awareness uh, of themselves to really build that team uh, that is so strong. Uh, and then Dr. Rachel, uh, of course, you warmed my heart when you started to talk about uh, the power of, of networks. Uh, one of the things that I, I speak to often is, uh, I know from my career uh, to get where I've come and where I'm going uh, has been part of my, my board of directors uh, and really leaning into different roles that people play uh, in my life. And uh, one of them is on the panel with us right now, Dr. Rachel. Um, but I, I do, I think it's so important to have mentors and coaches and, and sponsors. Uh, and there certainly is a difference between those three different roles uh, mm -hmm. as, as well. And Montrella, if it's okay, I'd love to kind of unpack that uh, a little bit as well. Um, uh, you know, a mentor is someone who really is supporting you and they understand where, where you've come from and where you're going and they can provide great insight uh, from that perspective. Uh, typically a coach is focused on your strengths uh, or shoring up areas of, of gaps that you have um, and they support that growth and learning that you're gonna have. 
um, a sponsor is someone that really is there to, to advocate for you. Uh, and it's important, especially for a woman audience to realize that statistically, uh, most women do not have sponsors in their organization. Um, and a, a sponsor is someone who's at a higher level of authority. Uh, they're going to be in meetings that you're not involved in. Uh, and they really advocate for you with your ability and skill and provide uh, visibility and maybe opportunities to, to stretch assignments. Uh, and so certainly uh, Dr. Rachel has been a part of my personal life and professional life uh, by being on uh, my board of directors uh, and really coming to me at a, at a certain pivotal time in my career uh, where I was uh, looking and aspiring to see someone that looked like me um, and to uh, get rid of some of the inner critic that was going on at the time. So I can't echo enough uh, about what Dr. Rachel and Dr. Uh, Jennifer said about relationships and networks uh, and how important they are also. So let's move on to that question. I don't know, Dr. Rachel and Dr. Jen, if you wanna follow up with, with um, Ramona's statements, but um, I know um, Dr. Jen, you are in an industry that's male dominated and um, with women being even a larger minority in the leadership. So um, you've also noted about having men or males that have been mentors to you. Um, how did this come to be and how did you leverage their mentorship and sponsorship along the path of your career growth? Yeah, you know, I, I was, um, it, Ramona, when I was, when I heard you talking about your intellectual curiosity and your intentionality, um, you know, I was thinking about how naive I was in my career because um, I was like, oh, I'm, you know, I want to go to medical school. I want to be a doctor. And that seemed very straightforward, you know, and then you become a doctor and you start, you know, practicing medicine. And I'll be very honest, I never had the intention of being in hospital administration. That was never on my bucket list. That was never, I, I, I just wanted to be a doctor. And what happened was I started working um, with these men in medicine who really saw in me something that I didn't realize that I had myself and the potential that I had. And I was very fortunate because these men really um, mentored me uh, they coached me, they were my sponsors, um, and it, it, I, I definitely would not be here today in the position that I am if it weren't for these um, individuals looking for opportunities for me and for helping to see in myself what I didn't see. Um, specifically, um, there's one individual, his name is Dr. Titus Shears, who just is phenomenal. He is the chair of our um, graduate medical education department here at Cleveland Clinic Akron General. He's known me since I was a, a baby intern doctor in 2001 when I first came here. And um, he's really helped me to kind of navigate hospital administration and understand, you know, what are the rules of engagement? And, you know, although we may aspire for a situation where there is complete gender equity and racial and ethnic um, parity. Um, that's not the world in which we live right now. And um, he was really able to help me to grow in my own um, kind of administrative skin and, um, and then also to help to be that ally for me as well. And then another um, kind of mentor I had was uh, two individuals who were my prior department chairs, Dr. Eric Jennison and Dr. Um, Justin Lavin. They both were just incredible advocates for me and really just helping me to come along in my growth as a hospital administrator. And I will say that the thing that I did as they were um, you know, providing this guidance to me is that I continued to say yes, even when it was uncomfortable, even when I doubted myself, even when I didn't see myself in the positions that they saw me in. Um, I continued to navigate that discomfort and say yes, because, um, because that's what we have to do, right? I think as women, confidence is always an issue. And um, we have to draw that inner strength and we have to say yes um, to those opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah. No, please go, go right ahead. I, I was just going to say, Dr. Jen, you know, I early on in my career, I, I didn't have that level of uh, purpose and, and intent. 
Um, and it was actually a sponsor uh, who really talked to me about my potential, our former CEO and, and president, Virginia Atticott. Um, and throughout my career, she's been uh, a mentor and a, a sponsor for me. Uh, but when she saw something in me mm -hmm. uh, that I had not saw, it did allow me to dream bigger uh, and think larger than what um, the, the possibilities were right there at that time. Um, and so as I started to navigate my career and found myself in that pivotal place of being on an executive team, but not seeing someone that looked like me, uh, again, I went to her to share um, the challenge of showing up and being authentic at that time. Uh, and she was the person who actually introduced me to Dr. Rachel. Um, and so I, I cannot say enough about um, those sponsors and those individuals that really help us uh, kind of navigate through our career. And especially when they see things that we don't, uh, they allow us to tap into a much deeper place uh, than we may be at that time. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Virginia, um, for that just blessed introduction um, that came at such a, a wonderful time for, for both of us. But I, you know, one of the things that I, that I think is a thread here, um, listening to both Ramona and Dr. Jen, is the power of allyship. We're all women. Some of us, well, all of us women of color, Dr. Jen as well is, is um, uh, a woman of color as well. And, and, um, and each of us have had uh, those who are not, who do not look like us necessarily to come to our aid and mentor, sponsor and champion us, um, which I think is, is again, a lesson for, for all of us to, um, to reach out a hand to those who don't necessarily look like us. Some may need a hand up, some may need, uh, it may be there to, to reach down to you, um, but I think it's really important. Um, I, I, like you, Dr. Jen, had a very, very similar situations when I was in banking. Um, I, you know, I was the only, always the only, the only woman, the only person of color, um, and, uh, and quite free, quite frequently, um, particularly in the, the banking world back then, um, the only, um, uh, uh, individual that even had a color on <laughs> that wasn't blue or black. Um, and so, and, and, but I was able to, uh, fortunately, so to the, to the, the power that you were talking about, Jen, to saying yes, is build relationships with, again, being trustworthy and building relationships with those who had more power, obviously, um, more privilege, obviously, and they, they, uh, many of them used that power and privileged privilege to support me. One in particular um, individual who is still my mentor today, I love him dearly and I talk about him all the time, um, Pat Mullen. Um, when I was 36 uh, and my, my then husband was 36 and he passed away suddenly, um, I, Pat Mullen was able to, um, to take me under his wing and we couldn't be more different. He's uh, an accountant. He's a white male. He's, uh, you know, um, uh, but we, we fell in love with one another over our love of Africa. He was, he loved, he loves animals. He loves the safari. I've been to Africa 17 times. And so we, we bonded on that issue. Um, and, uh, and, and after Mark passed away and I felt like I was no longer spiritually connected to banking, he was the person that I went to. Um, he, he wasn't necessarily, he wasn't at my house every day. He wasn't my family, those who, who kept me alive, uh, frankly, but professionally, because he had a different perspective to your point, uh, Ramona, about diversity prediction theorem, because he wasn't like me and didn't have my experiences, he was able to share with me and show me um, the way to pull all of the things that I loved about my job and bring that into a business. 
um, which is successful and thriving today. So I, I think, uh, you know, if there's anything that you take away from this um, to, to our audience, if there's anything that you take away from this, um, really allyship and the power of allyship is so very important. So how can each one of us become better allies uh, as we move into 2022? Well. I must say, I am mesmerized by this discussion and you're making my job very easy as the moderator, your, your passion for these topics. So let's go into, um, you know, throughout our careers, our lives, there are catalytic moments that can change the trajectory of, of our lives. And sometimes we don't realize they are, um, you know, moment changing or catalytic until we're there, or it's happened. So um, these moments help us to shape who we are. And I'm curious to hear about those moments for you, what they look like. Let's start with um, Dr. Rachel on this one. Dr. Rachel, you, you talked about the tragic murder of George, George Floyd and um, that served as a moment for you. Can you talk about how this moment changed the way you think about things um, like authenticity and the way you approach work and, and life in general? Yes, uh, and thank you, thank you so much for that question. Um, you know, George Floyd. When I when I think about the tragedy um, of his of his death and the eight minutes and forty six seconds that we were able to watch. If you watch the trial, it was nine minutes and forty seconds. But um, when I think about the impact of of that tragedy, I think about his daughter, who was on the shoulders of her uncle saying, my daddy changed the world. My daddy changed the world. And I think about her all the time. Um, and I want to make what she said true. So as I watched uh, George Floyd being murdered, his life taken from us, um, obviously I, I was, was told, received a message. Okay, your God job, now your day job, period. Like no, 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 like, Stop, full stop. Um, four days later, again, I signed up for, for Cornell. But I also, I, I had, I already had the, the skills, talents and abilities to do the work because I was already doing the work in diversity, equity and inclusion. We had been doing that work for 15 years. The issue is that I had put it over there and, and, and differentiating and, and differentiated it. So George Floyd, um, taught me a few things. Number one, be authentic. So, um, so you know, on the IDI at that point or or earlier, but but still, I had been in moderation, right? And some of that was about me hiding my blackness, my femaleness, in order to succeed in banking. That's what I felt that I had to do, which is what Ramona was talking about when she said, I don't see myself in leadership. I, I can't see myself in leadership. I'm, I'm not reflected there, right? And so I felt that I had to, to behave and Jen can speak to this as well in leadership, that you have to turn into someone else in order to, to succeed. And so after George Floyd, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna have blue nails or whatever I want to do, I'm going to do it because we, the hiding of ourselves, I think is damaging um, and destructive, not only to ourselves, but to others who could appreciate who we authentically are. And so, um, and so, so, so being myself, my full beautiful blackness in all its glory was one thing that George Floyd gave to me. Another thing that he gave to me was the ability to take those superpowers, that empathy, that strategic thinking to the global marketplace and serve these clients. Because if I don't, then they won't become inclusive leaders and we won't be making the world a better place. And so every day I get up and I take those superpowers and that blessing and that faith and think, how can I change the world today? Because George Floyd, my daddy, changed the world. So, I, you know, he, it is such a loss to have had him or anyone else be uh, killed or hurt by violence. But if someone has to be, 
then I'm, I'm, I feel so blessed and honored that I can take his legacy as an ancestor and lean into it to make the world a better place. Thank you. And then Ramona, how about you? Is there a, a, a catalytic moment that you would be willing to share with the group? Um, how did it change things for you? Um, what did it look like? How did you prepare for it? Absolutely. Actually, there, there's two I'll, I'll share fairly quickly. Um, one is uh, just, just the way I was uh, raised and born. Uh, so my uh, mother was pregnant with me and my father uh, drowned in a tragic accident. Um, and so I was, I was raised as a reminder uh, of my dad, who was the youngest of four. Um, and so it was very impactful with the positive intent um, that I received from my grandparents and my mother and the rest of my family, just around the ability of uh, being and doing anything that I wanted. Um, and so we, we did not have a lot of financial means, but there was rich conversation around possibilities. And so I certainly think that shaped me early on. Um, but to Dr. Rachel's point, I think the last year um, was another pivotal time for me. Um, you know, I started 2020 in a place of, of great celebration of achieving uh, a role of being the first uh, as an African-American uh, president and CEO within the FedEx uh, Corporation and uh, raising two daughters. My older daughter was the one uh, as I signed the offer letter and called home to let them know it was official um, actually said to me, Ma, did you just make history? Did you break the glass ceiling? Um, and I realized at that point, I had a great opportunity with a platform uh, to share uh, not only my story, um, but to really represent uh, being an African-American woman and, and leading in a way that was authentic to me. Um, and so that's, that's how January 2020 started. And then with the death of George Floyd, um, that was a pivotal time for me to really decide to show up as me always or try to be someone else uh, during that challenging time. Um, and so during that time, I decided to lean in um, and utilize uh, the platform, uh, the title uh, and power and authority I have uh, to let individuals know the importance of being themselves. Uh, and it included uh, small things from uh, changing my hairstyle uh, to allowing uh, individuals know that uh, you can show up at work and you can show up uh, outside of work being who you are, because it takes a lot of energy uh, to be someone else. Um, and so I, I really reflect on uh, 2020 and those moments as I move forward in 2021 to make sure that I am uh, authentic, uh, that I uh, lead with a purpose. Uh, and it's because of those uh, situations that have happened uh, that I feel so strongly about it. Thank you. And then Dr. Jen, how about yourself? Or was there a defining moment for you that sticks out? Yeah, you know, mine, um, so I'm going to go just a little bit of a different direction. Um, certainly, Dr. Rachel and Ramona, just, uh, it's so inspiring to hear um, how the events of this past year have really impacted you. And I think from my perspective, um, honestly, not being a Black woman, um, you know, it's, it has impacted um, me in a way that is is different. And I think that I, there's no way that I can fully understand um, how this impacted you, how this impacted the black community, how this impacted um, people who uh, who don't look like me, right? Um, but I, it's so inspiring to hear your voices and to hear your perspectives um, to really help me to, to to be a better person and to really um, to, to make sure that that I'm authentic as well and that I allow other people to be authentic in the way that is true to themselves. So I thank you for that. Thank you for um, for sharing sharing those feelings. Um, I, I am going to take just a little bit of a different uh, perspective here on those defining moments um, because mine really had to do with um, work and family. And, um, you know, we hear a lot, I get questions all the time about, um, 
work-life balance, right? <laughs> and my my answer to everybody is always it's it's a fallacy. There there is no balance between work and life. You it, work and life are a series of choices. And when you're at work, you're at work. When you're at home, you're at home. And um, you know the the concept that we can balance those two. To me, at least, I haven't found that answer. Um, so one of the defining moments that I experienced, it, it really, and again, I think to Ramona's point, it's a series of series of choices, a series of decisions. Um, you know, being in medicine is a, a terrible, it's terrible for work-life balance. And then being an obstetrician is like the, probably one of the ultimate uh, disruptors of work-life balance. Um, I had my children all when I was um, in medical school and residency. So they were all very young children, um, probably at the peak of my busyness in my practice. And, um, you know, and that, that, that's a whole, that's a conversation for a whole nother panel. Um, but ultimately when my kids were about middle school, late elementary, middle school age, um, I was, uh, in my private, private, private practice and I was the program director for the residency. And, um, it was about that time that I realized, you know what, I actually cannot do it all that this concept that we can do everything and that we can be satisfied by doing everything. I realized, for me at least, that was a fallacy. And so I had to make that hard decision that there had to be sacrifices um, so that I could at least have the life and be the mother and be the wife and be the doctor that I wanted to be and that, that I felt that I was called to be. And so really that defining moment for me was when I left my private practice. And I decided to become fully employed by the hospital, really focusing on my administrative responsibilities and, and kind of sacrificing to some degree that clinical aspect, that direct patient care, those relationships that I had just spent the last 15 years developing. Um, and that was really hard because I loved my practice. Uh, the, I, I loved my partner in practice. Um, I loved my office staff and my office manager and the patients most of all. And that was really difficult because everything that I had, um, you know, envisioned being a doctor, I was giving that up for this next direction. And that was really pivotal for, pivotal for me. And I can say 150%, I made the right decision. Um, you know, I, it's kind of funny if you ask my kids, they're going to tell you, oh, she was just as busy <laughs> once she left her private practice as she was when she was in private practice. Um, but at least from my, my standpoint, I'm at peace for the decisions that I made and the, the type of mom that I am and the wife that I have become. Um, but that was really, um, that was a very, that was a, definitely a pivotal time for me to help me to realign um, my actions with my values. And, um, you know, I definitely am a better person for it. So what I'm hearing from the group, and one thing that I hope resonates with the listeners is that authenticity, being yourself, and just owning up to whatever situation or environment you're in, that's, um, I hope the group is um, picking that up from this discussion. So uh, let's go into um, goal setting. Um, goals, as we know, are critical, and there's something that each of you sitting here um, can certainly understand in a big way. Um, there's a lot of conversation around goal setting, um, being ready when the opportunity arises. Let's unpack that, talk a little bit more about that whole concept. Um, so Ramona, how have you set your eyes on where you want to be and what was instrumental in getting you there? And how did you approach goal setting um, as well as the leader of a very large company? And what has the constant change imposed by the pandemic? taught you? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with my, my methodology because it's, it's personal, it's professional, but it's, it's really looking at the things that I value and the things that I, I want to achieve. And I, I typically set goals uh, from a five-year out uh, standpoint and then work myself uh, back. I can see Dr. Rachel shaking her head. <laughs> I'm the attention detailed one. She is the big picture creative one. I love um, But but I, I set goals and I, I think about the, the pillars of, of my life. And so there's, there's career, there is my self-care, there are uh, relationships that I, I want to foster or, or grow or have. 
Um, there's the success and wealth that I want to have as an individual as well. But I really walk through um, those areas of my life and um, set, set those goals. Uh, and to Dr. Jen's point, you know, I don't believe there's balance, but there are choices you can make. And so I prioritize uh, around what those goals are. Uh, and I try to leverage uh, the 24 hours we have in a day uh, doing the things that I think are important to uh, establish uh, and hit those goals. Um, and again, going back to my uh, level of attention to detail, I put it on a calendar because there's so much time you have a day. And I try to reflect when I feel that I'm having a week or a couple weeks that um, I'm spending time in places not doing the, the work that I feel is the important work. I kind of look at it on my calendar and when I'm really good at it, things are color coded so I can just look at it and go, I, my priorities are not being lived out. Uh, with my calendar. And so then I need to shift it. And that typically me means making boundaries and uh, being comfortable with saying no uh, to things to get back to the priority and focus for my goals. You know, I, I just have to say, Ramona, you are inspiring me. Because <laughs> yeah. As soon as Montella, you said goal setting, I was like, oh, this is, I am not the poster child for goal setting at all. Um, I, I know in my lifetime, I've had, you know, very finite goals that I set for myself and I, and I, and I planned, but you have certainly inspired me. I was actually taking notes as you were talking because I want to sit down and, you know, I, I need to set goals. Um, and I, I'm embarrassed. I wish I had something better to, to say to people. Um, but my personal goal setting is definitely an area that I need to, um, I need to focus and, and uh, it puts some effort towards professional goal setting. I am in line with my organization. I develop my professional goals according to the mission, vision, values, goals of our organization. I can do that. But when it comes to myself, I have a lot of work to do. I may need to be calling you, Rachel. So <laughs> Yeah, and, and, um, and the interesting thing is Ramona was laughing because um, I wrote a book um, as you know, called Flourish, Have It All Without Losing Yourself. And every pillar that she's talking about is reflected in my book. It is, it is about um, really reflecting on what, what is important to you and, um, and, and, and creating a plan. It doesn't have to be written down. It doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but really seeing yourself into that and leaning into, into that area uh, of relationships, of work and wealth, of, of spirituality, of legacy, of service, of, uh, of uh, self-care. And um, so I, I laughed at Ramona because, again, I, I coach women to, to set goals and I hold them accountable <laughs> to meeting those goals. <laughs> However, personally, <laughs> I'm a lot like Dr. Jen. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I, I literally do it for a living. Um, but um, but I, I, so let me just let me just kind of take the middle ground here um, because I think it's important for people to know. Um, literally, Ramona and I are yin and yang, and there's nothing right or wrong with either way to be. As long as you accomplish the goals that you that you, you that you're going in this the right direction toward uh, toward your goal and toward your purpose, the reason that God put you here, in, at least in my opinion, as a woman of faith. So um, so so I think the middle ground to allow for people like Jen to not feel bad that they're not Ramona with her color coding, um, you know, is is that. You know what? What is the overall framework that you want for your life, right? Um, I wanted to be a psych psychiatrist my whole life. I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I was psych pre med um, in 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 undergrad, starting at the age of six, um, and my life took a turn, and that's okay, right? It's okay to 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 make goals and then change your mind. It's okay to have um, goals that are not written down, but you know the direction that you want to take. It's okay to have to, to and, and this is really, really important. I was just telling my friend Mary Kay's daughter this uh, uh, the, other, uh, the other evening. You don't have to know what you want to do, 
either, right? It's okay to um, to to think that you want to be a doctor today, an accountant tomorrow, and uh, you know a scuba diver the the following day. The most important thing that I can share with you is to follow your passion, to really think about your passion and your purpose and your God-given expertise in each of these areas and make sure that you have enough to sustain yourself thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that you do have enough to give back to those around you. And at the end of the day, I think that's the most important element um, of, of planning. So you can either be me or you can be Ramona um, and, and, and Jen with Jen somewhere in the middle. Um, but if, as long as you're working every day on, on living the life that God put you here to live, then you'll be all right. I appreciate this discussion um, because some of us are very rigid with our goals, but it's nice to hear from Dr. Rachel and the variations in that, you know, we still can be effective in our goal setting. And um, even we need to be more flexible in some cases, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Okay, so um, how about um, talking about um, with um, three dynamic leaders we have on the presentation today, um, we all know that leadership is critical. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the way each of you approach this um, topic, leading and leadership. Uh, so with this one, um, Dr. Jen, um, when we spoke, you talked about servant leadership and how this plays a role in your style of leadership. Can you talk more about this and what it means to you? Yeah, so um, I, you know, as I've gone through, as I'm going through my leadership journey and um, trying to identify kind of um, what type of leader I am, uh, I, I've definitely identified with being a servant leader. And I think in healthcare, um, it's very, very common to see hospital, um, physicians, especially physician leaders, um, being in that servant leader role. And I will, uh, you know, I have to give credit to Cleveland Clinic Akron General um, because that is the kind of leadership style that um, that my hospital and my administration helps to develop within our leaders. And essentially, what that means is that we, I am here for my teams. I am here to support them to help them to do what they need to do to ultimately be sure that we're providing the safest, the best healthcare for our patients and for our communities. And that we are ensuring that the environments in which we're doing that is providing the best um, place for our caregivers, um, the best experience for our caregivers, um, and ultimately the best experience for our patients as well. So, you know, it's, it's, I think that it um, uh, fits very well with my personality type and the fact that I am so um, relational with people. Um, but but I think that it also helps me to um, to know my purpose. You know, obviously I need to guide my team. I need to direct my team. I need to make sure that what we're doing is in line with the mission, vision, values, and goals of my organization. But I'm able to do that in a very supportive um, supportive way and helping. Um, helping my team to achieve those goals that we have. So it's been, uh, I, I, I couldn't imagine like, you know, with, with learning about different leadership styles, you know, the, all the different types of leaders that you can be. And I, and I really, I think that in the end, we're a hybrid of many different types. Um, but I, I feel that being a servant leader um, feels very natural for me and uh, definitely helps me to know that I'm in the right place um, to be that type of a leader. Thank you. And then Ramona, as the leader of a large company, um, you're responsible for setting the vision of the organization, the strategy, um, but you recognize your leadership team and employees must understand and buy into it, right? So in order to be effective, um, and so can you talk about your approach to leadership, specifically how you go about engaging employees and leaders to, sh uh, to ensure a shared vision? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, Dr. Jen touched on it a, a little bit. It's so important to have the uh, team at the executive level all the way down the organization to understand the vision, uh, be aligned to it, and then commit it to the work that uh, needs to be done. Um, and what I found to be effective in that is, is communication. Um, and so I remember reading an article that said, 
uh, you have to communicate something about eight times for individuals to um, understand it. And so it goes back to being being intentional uh, with how we are communicating uh, not only the words of our, our vision and our goal and our mission, uh, but really our actions to support that as well. And so a couple things I, I try to uh, ensure we do as an organization is uh, once it's been set, uh, then the executive uh, level team Team really needs to understand it themselves and uh, debate and discuss uh, questions that we anticipate others will have. Um, we need to have uh, clear messaging as we start to communicate it uh, throughout the organization. And so some of the things that I do uh, from a tactical standpoint is uh, the organization, every quarter we do town halls. Uh, it's an opportunity to say what we're going to do and how we did uh, the previous three months. Um, every month, um, I do a, a state of the union with all performance leaders. Um, and then I do some opportunities that allow me to get even closer to the organization. Um, in our virtual state, I do coffee with Ramona, uh, where I'm doing a Zoom call one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with leaders. Uh, and then prior to COVID, I was doing Ramona roundtables, where it really allowed me after sharing with the organization our uh, vision and strategy uh, at every level of the organization, get a sense about what excited them. Uh, also, what were they concerned about? Where were their fears? Uh, realizing that uh, people look at change differently. Uh, it's important to know who uh, may uh, not understand the purpose of the change and ensuring that we articulate it, uh, knowing the individuals that are advocating for the change and they're engaged in it, uh, as well as knowing individuals that um, are not uh, aligned with the change and may be disengaged as we move forward with the work that we need to do. Uh, and so I think it's important as a leader to understand that um, and then ensure that the work that we do and the behaviors that we uh, instill represent uh, what we're trying to get accomplished. Uh, and we're uh, also looking at our, our team members and holding them uh, responsible to the commitment that uh, they have to have in order to execute uh, what that mission and strategy is as well. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Dr. Rachel, you focus a lot on um, of your work in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as you know, leadership plays a key role in any organization and truly impacts um, change in the space. What do you feel makes a strong leader and what kind of env environment do strong leaders set to bring out the best in their employees? Well, thank you for that, uh, that question. And uh, Ramona's and uh, Dr. Jen's responses were, uh, were spot on uh, as it relates to, to what is leadership. Um, I, I define, I, I actually have uh, nine leadership principles. I'm not gonna go through those, but I will just sort of define what, what leadership means to me anyway, um, what leaders should do. Um, so the first thing that a leader must do is to set and communicate a clear vision, right? And so, you know, so Dr. Jen talked about um, this notion that that she wants to live within her purpose, but that she goes back to the vi mission, vision, and values of the organization. So a leader must really set a clear mission, vision, and values, a clear purpose, uh, a clear um, outcome for where you're going to, to get to if you follow me. Right, And so they have to have that, but they also have to communicate that in a way that people understand um, and in a way that, that inspires uh, people. The second thing that uh, a leader must do is, is once they've communicated that vision uh, to, the, to their team and to, or to their followers, because if they're alone, they're not leading anyone, right? <laughs> right. In order to be a leader, you have to have those who would follow you. Um, and so once they have communicated that, then they have to make sure that the, 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 those who follow them have the tools and resources to be successful. So if I tell you we're gonna go to California and we're gonna 
sit on the beach and have martinis, and yet I give you a map to Maine, then I have not given you the tools and resources to be successful. And I think sometimes leaders fall off the map here and, and don't really, to Ramona's point, listen to what what the, the 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 aspirations and fears of their teams are, right? Um, to to hear the hopes and dreams um, of the of those team members, and to ensure that they have the tools and resources, whether that's leadership development training, uh, education, um, uh, mentoring, and sponsoring. All of those tools uh, need to be uh, need to be in place. And then finally, everyone needs to be held accountable, including the leader, right? holding people responsible and accountable to doing the things that they've promised they would do, just like any brand, um, they need to be held accountable. Now, what, what does all of this have to do with uh, inclusion and, and, and trust? Well, if you think about the, the elements of trust, a, a strong leader must engender trust in those who would follow him. Uh, or her, and so benevolence—the idea that my, but that your needs are in, as important to me as my own, that I am looking out for you and your your needs, um, that I'm listening to your met and unmet needs, competence that I have the uh, the skills, the abilities, the education, uh, the experience, whatever it takes, I have the competence to do the things that I've said that I was going to do. And then finally, integrity, that I have every intention of living out those things, that I am honest and that, I, and that you and I have shared values. Um, in order to be a great leader, you must engender trust um, along at least one or two of those uh, perspectives. I try to live up to all three. And what does this all have to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion? We are never going to have the kind of inclusive world that you and I dream of that, you, that would put me out of a job where I never have to work again in diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is my dream goal. Um, if we don't have trusted leaders, if we don't have engaged leaders, if we don't have leaders who present that vision, give their teams the tools, talents, and, 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 and resources to be successful, and then hold them accountable. And so um, creating great leaders, from my perspective, is creating inclusive leaders. Um, and it's just ensuring that people have uh, the, the knowledge to understand that across the 36 dimensions of diversity, that they are also giving each uh, employee, each team member, each customer, each stakeholder, regardless of where they fall on those 36 dimensions of diversity, the tools and resources they need to be successful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so we are going into our final question, um, just discussing in hindsight for 2020 and um, when we are intentional about reflecting on the past and it can often provide us guidance relative to the perspective we have for the future. It can also provide insight to others who can learn from experiences. So if you could go back to the you at the start of your career, knowing that you, knowing what you know now what would you tell yourself? I'll, I'll, oh, go, please, Dr. Rachel, go ahead, please. Um, so, so three things. The first is that um, I would tell myself to be authentic from day one. Um, I, I think we we have had to learn, particularly women of color, but all women and 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 all marginalized groups have had to really dig deep to be authentic. Today we have a law in Congress about hair, literally about black women's and men's hair in 2021. So I, I would go back and say, be yourself. Whatever that means to you, however that looks to you, be yourself. That's the first thing. The second thing that I would I would say is uh, echoing Dr. Jen is to say yes more often and to say no more often. I'm gonna say that one more time for the people in the back. Say yes more often 
but also say no more often, right? So that's about primacy. That's about priorities. That's about, that's, that's about digging into your inner Ramona, right? And saying, what is most important uh, to me and to my life? And then the final thing that I would say, and again, I've always been a woman of faith. Um, I always will be a woman of faith. I, I would say to, um, to, to dig into and learn more about your relationship with God earlier and, and, and more stronger. Um, because I think that that has served me so well. And I think it, it serves those whom I serve very well. So I think we have, uh, that's just so profound that I think we have about a minute left for any final comments on this question. And then I believe Dr. Jim will close out the program for us. Oh, I'll add one. I think Dr. Rachel really did uh, define it well. Uh, one of the things personally that I, I wish I would have started to uh, focus on earlier is um, leaning into gratitude and taking time for joy. Uh, I, I'm a very result-driven person and uh, I am learning uh, really the value of uh, being grateful for the things that I have and taking those moments to be happy and joyful uh, about them as well. Hey, it's working. <laughs> you have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I, you know, the only thing that I'll add is, um, and, and I think that this kind of goes along, especially, you know, Dr. Rachel, what you're talking about with faith, because faith is a really very strong part of who I am. And um, if anybody knows me, they're gonna know, they're gonna know this line, and that is that everything is gonna work out exactly the way it's supposed to. It may not be the way we want it to work out. It may not be the way we thought it was gonna work out. But for some way, shape, form, reason, it's working out the way it is, and 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 that's okay. And we're going to, um, you know, that that it's that it's gonna be okay. And uh, that's really uh, the mantra that I live by. And um, you know, take it a day at a time. Sometimes that's all we can do. So I am going to take this opportunity to close out our program. Um, thank you, Montrella, for um, guiding this fantastic conversation. Ramona, Dr. Rachel, thank you so much for um, this incredible opportunity to be on this panel with you and to have this conversation. I feel like we need to now go out to Akron Family Restaurant and um, continue our, <laughs> our conversation. I've got so much to learn from you guys. Um, you, you really are all so truly inspiring. And um, just to know that you're in our community and that you're leading in our community just makes me feel so much better about our community. And, um, and Dr. Rachel, I know you are gonna change the world. I have absolutely no doubts about that. You're, you're already changing it and, and you as well, Ramona. <laughs> So as we close out this year's Women of Achievement program on behalf of the Women's Network Leadership Institute, um, I'd like to thank everyone involved in planning this great event. Jan Conrad, um, all of the work that you've done for us over the years, and of course the staff at the Greater Accra Chamber, the Women of Achievement Selection Committee for the very tough job that they had uh, selecting our, um, our, our, the women that we're honoring today, and of course all of our sponsors. Um, thank you for helping us to honor Nicole Hagee CNF Pet Insurance, and of course, our Woman of Achievement, Dr. Rachel Talton. I'd also like to thank everybody who joined us this morning. You are a part of what's making the difference in our region and moving the needle to ensure that our businesses and organizations truly reflect the communities in which we live, work, and play. The Women's Network Leadership Institute is excited to partner with all of you in those efforts. So thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and we look forward to the wonderful things that the rest of 2021 will bring to us. Thank you.